Hello, everybody, and welcome to the class. We have some people watching on Zoom directly, but also this is recorded specifically for Facebook um, and also the YouTube channel because the connection last week, as people probably know, was a little difficult on Facebook Live. And this is the reason I am recording the class. And maybe during the class, more people may attend, but um, the structure will be very similar today compared to the other days. And we just continue with more vocabulary, more expressions, more grammar. And it's a good opportunity, hopefully, for everybody to learn some new expressions and new grammar. And hopefully you will enjoy the class. And as I have said before, the objective of this class is to teach for free because of the restrictions, because of the pandemic. Lots of people's situations have changed and I am the same. So I think this is the best opportunity at the moment. So I hope you enjoy the class. It's a possibility. Some people are watching for the first time, but it's also possible some people are attending again for the other time. So I'm going to share the screen and hopefully we have no uh, big difficulty with the audio, with the video, and hopefully the connection will be okay. And of course, we have some people at home, so hopefully there's no big distraction as well. So on the left here, you can see the plan for the week, and this is the typical schedule in the mornings. At nine o'clock, we have a speaking class, and it's very, very good. Lots of people have the opportunity to practice speaking, and um, it's a good opportunity to meet new people during the pandemic and different topics and also corrections for vocabulary. So this is every morning at nine o'clock and people are welcome to attend and welcome to join. And the second point is the free class will continue at quarter past 11 at this time. And we will do very similar structures in um, most classes. But as I explained already, it's the objective, okay? And then finally, there are different webinars every day and four o'clock most days, we have different webinars today. Saturday, we have another webinar at one o'clock in relation to the B2 first certificate exam. So that is the plan for the week. Next week will be hopefully practically the same. And I look forward to hopefully you participating and um, joining the class. So social media, if you want to connect on uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, here is all the information. And some of you, of course, are already connected. And I put some tips some advice, some information about English in relation to um, connected to the Instagram page and Twitter and YouTube. Okay, so that's the information. Um, so let's start. So here you can see the introduction. I have a document in relation to grammar. I explain as a warm up exercise every morning. Some of you are probably going to fall asleep because you have seen this so many times, but even though you are very good at English, this document is important to refresh every day to give you a structure and to give you a, a base for the class because during the class I use this document frequently. Then probably we have an article from the National Geographic and the vocabulary is very very good quality probably advanced again so yesterday's vocabulary was very advanced and very fluent and very good and today will practically be the same in relation to the quality but again very fluent and very, very good quality vocabulary. So I'm really um, looking forward to that article. And probably we will continue as well with phrasal verb explanations and idioms. So I'm just going to explain now exactly what phrasal verbs and idioms are because they are very, very big part of English. So this document is the most important document for me. There are three sections when we learn English. For me, the first section is use of English, which is so important. And in the use of English, we have the phrasal verbs, we have idioms, we have different accents, and we have different dialects, okay? Also pronunciation. So basically, in different parts of the world, people speak English a little differently. People have different rhythms, different velocities, um, velocities, velocities, oh my God, different speeds and different rhythms in relation to um, English. So this is a big part of English. And when you learn, this is problematic. As I said, a phrasal verb, the concept of the phrasal verb is a verb plus a preposition, and it's possible literal significance, but frequently there is a double and a second significance for phrasal verbs, and that's a big part of English, and it's a huge area to focus on. And we have thousands 
of phrasal verbs, but we use them all the time. So it's really important that you are familiar with phrasal verbs because they are the key to really understanding fluent English. And I recommend a lot that you analyze and know phrasal verbs in detail, okay? Because they're tricky, but they're the key to learning, learning English. Idioms or expressions are a very important part of English as well. And again, we use expressions all the time with family, with friends, with uh, formal situations, informal situations. Idioms are a big part of English. And I will try to explain some particular idioms during the class, okay? Conversation. So when you're learning English, it's important that you try regularly to practice conversation. It's difficult to find people, maybe, but online you have a lot of possibilities and it's a big recommendation to try regularly to practice conversation. Pronunciation is sometimes is tricky in English. We have difficult uh, sounds and sometimes very irregular sounds in pronunciation. So this is very important. And during the class, I try to help and try to identify with the difficult words for pronunciation. So that's the most important section, in my opinion, it's the use of English. The next section are the tenses. So when we speak in English, we have different tenses. You need to be very familiar of the concepts. For example, the present simple, past simple, future simple. The past simple has a lot of irregular verbs, and this is a massive part of English, the irregular verbs in the past simple. We also have the present continuous, past continuous, future continuous. The next concept is the perfect, present perfect, past perfect, future perfect. So the idea of the per present perfect is the action that's finished in the past, but it is related and the consequences are very important to the present. For example, I have spoken to my friend, it's finished, it's completed, but the information from the conversation is relevant to now. And then the past perfect is typically the period of time before another action in the past simple. OK, so that's the concept of the simple, the continuous and the perfect. The infinitive is the base or the foundation of the verb. And typically it's the preposition to, to hear, to go, to meet, to look, to talk. That's the infinitive and very, very key part of English. And again, during the class, I mentioned frequently the concept of the infinitive. Conditionals in the book, maybe you're very familiar with the conditionals. We have the zero, first, second, third mixed conditionals, the theory is a little heavy, the theory is a little uh, depressing, <laughs> and it's very strict to follow the rules for the conditional, but in reality, in conversation, it's a little less strict and more flexible, in my opinion. It's basically related to the word if, if you go to the shop, you will buy something. So there's different rules for the conditional, and it's a big area and very important in English. The final concept that's a little advanced is the active and the passive. So the structure of the active is generally the subject, the verb and the object. I walk the dog, but then to create the passive, which is a little more advanced, we change the position. The dog introduce an extra verb to be is walked, the participle, by me. So that's a little example of the active and the passive, but it's a big part of English and it's uh, very advanced and very, very frequent in English. OK, so other grammar concepts, other grammar terms. I use in the class, for example, the noun. A noun is a person, a place, or a thing. For example, Brian, Dublin, classroom, doctor, all nouns. Every noun, you need an article. For example, house, a house, or the house. We have two possible articles. There's one exception. When the noun begins with a vowel, a, e, i, o, u, we need the article, a, n, and the apple is one example. The apple, or an apple. The orange, but an orange, and that's the article, and that's the only irregular rule with the article. The adjective, the function of the adjective is to describe the noun. For example, uh, orange, the tasty orange in the noun, the adjective, and the article. So it's a very important structure. The position of the adjective is generally before the noun, because in other languages, the position is after, and that's a very important concept. Also, the countable, an uncountable concept in relation to the nouns is very, very important. For example, is it possible to count the noun or is it impossible? For example, water, air, chocolate, money. It's not really possible to count these things. So this, this is very important in relation to how much and how many. How much is related to uncountable and how many is related to countable. And this detail is very important. And some of you are probably 
familiar with this already. Adjectives, as I said, we have a concept comparative and superlative. For example, this house is big, but this house is bigger than this house, but the next house is the biggest. This is the concept of comparing different things and using different adjectives. So that's a very important area. Also adverbs, the function of the adverb is to describe the verb, okay? And typically the position of the adverb is after the verb, drink slowly, talk quickly, run rapidly. And normally the adverb ends in L-Y and that's a big part of English. And you can identify the adverb usually with the L-Y ending or the L-Y suffix, okay? Modal verbs are a very particular class, a very tip, uh, particular group of verbs we use in particular situations. For example, can is for ability and, and permission, could, may, and might is for possibilities and options. Shall is typically a substitution for will in a question. It's more formal. Should and ought to are used in situations for recommendation and advice and must and have to are obligations. So modal verbs are a very special group of verbs and they are very important. The big rule, when you use a modal verb, the next verb is normally the infinitive, except we eliminate two. Okay, can go, might eat, should have. It's necessary to eliminate two. Okay, prepositions are key. We have maybe 150 prepositions and also they are related to direction, to movement and to position. For example, the pen is in my hand, over, under, beside, in front of, behind, above, below. For a position, also movement, I run across the road, under the bridge. Very, very important because we use these all the time. So it's necessary that you're very clear with all the phrasal, with all the prepositions, but also in the section of phrasal verbs, we use prepositions to combine with a verb to create a second significance. And that's very, very important. Usually it's associated with emotion. Okay, I'll explain a little more later, but they're very key in relation to phrasal verbs. The next little point is the difference between my pen, your pen, his pen, masculine, her pen, feminine, the adjective for possession, my pen, your pen, okay, or the pronoun for possession, the pen is mine, the pen is yours, the pen is his, masculine, the pen is hers, feminine. And finally, the third possibility is the object pronoun, give the pen to me, give the pen to you, give the pen to him, masculine, or give the pen to her. So that area is very, very important, particularly with the masculine and the feminine. Okay, so really key. Also, the difference between this, that, these, and those is important. I will explain during the class. Also, another, other, the other, and the others is important. The questions, how to create the questions is a big part. And also for me, a big area is to identify the suffixes and the prefixes in, a, in English is a big part to learn um, and to understand the form of the word. For example, is the word a noun? Is it adjective? Is it verb? Is it adverb? The suffix is the little ending of the word, which gives a big clue and a big indicator for the form of the word. For me, it's a very, very useful area to focus on. Conjunctions, linkers, we have some basic linkers but also we have some more advanced and proficient linkers and it's necessary you understand the difference in terms of formality and which is more appropriate in which case, okay? And that's more or less it's specific vocabulary. If you want to improve your vocabulary, a lot of people want to improve vocabulary and the best way to improve the vocabulary is to read. You need to read different books, different magazines, different newspapers. You need to read frequently. You need to read different topics. And that's the best way to improve your vocabulary, but also your grammar in general. That's a really, really good way to learn English. Okay, writing is a big part. So reading is important. Grammar is very important. Listening is very important that you listen to lots of things regularly. Speaking and writing, they are the five areas that are necessary to be maintained to improve your English. Exams are very popular as well. The Cambridge exam is popular and the IELTS exam is popular and um, we have specific groups but it's it's useful sometimes to prepare exams and that's it so that's the introduction for today now i want to probably begin 
immediately with the article from today. I'm sure you're very, very excited to see the article and the topic. So the topic here on the left is related to the National Geographic and specifically it's in relation to these type of stones. OK, so it's maybe from the area of travel and it's an article about these type of strange, unusual stones that we see in the countryside or that we see beside mountains and the explanation for them. Where did they come from? So that's the article. That's the topic of the text. But for me, the quality of the vocabulary is brilliant. It's very, very fluent, very natural, very native um, vocabulary for native speakers and fluent speakers. It's really, really good vocabulary again. And I just want to read for pronunciation and also to identify the key parts of grammar and the key parts for vocabulary. OK, so here I will begin. So here is the caption deposited thousands of years ago by a glacier. The obelisk boulder or boulder or boulder probably is number one boulder, which is the same as bold, because remember, the child is bold child and it means very bad behavior. Or maybe in the text, you can say bold text, um, which is negrito. For example, at the moment, this text is in bold, but now it's not bold. OK, so bold is very strong and you can say a bold decision, which is very brave. But here we have a boulder. We have an extra U and pronunciation issue. Probably here it's a little irregular for pronunciation. So the boulder is the pronunciation. And as I said, the comparative would be bolder than. So they're similar. Well, they're the same pronunciation, but the significance are very different. Very, very different. OK, here we have looms. So that's excellent vocabulary as well. Looms over the scales more. And that's a name for a mountain, I think, in England. So basically, this verb to loom is very, very fluent, very, very advanced. And I'll give you one example. My exam is looming. OK, you're starting your new job is looming. And it means it's very soon. It's in this position in the future, in the near future. It's like to hover. So we have a lot of difficult vocabulary to hover, to loom. So to hover is like float. So your plan, your holiday, your activity is hovering in the future. It's very close to you. OK, but we say the verb to loom. And it usually is maybe negative. OK, so exactly. Your exam is looming because you're worrying about it. It's on your mind, but it's not here. It's not in the present. It's in the in the future. So it's really, really good uh, example. And the exam is looming. Very, very good. And maybe for a person, you can say the person is looming and he is waiting to apply for the job or she is waiting for the, the position to be available. So it's flexible. So it's important if you want to have advanced English, it's important that you are familiar and maybe you recognize this. OK, and now I will just continue to read a little. So the real story behind the world's wandering rocks. OK, so OK, I'll begin already because the verb is important to wonder. We have two verbs and they're very, very different to wonder is when you are curious. I wonder what time the football match will start. I wonder if it will rain today. So it's curiosity verb to wonder but the verb to wonder is completely different it's like to walk with no direction like adventure okay so to wonder is maybe walk with adventure you can also say to stroll to ramble these are very very common vocabulary and very advanced um, and they are basically the same that you walk very casually enjoyable walk very relaxing walk with no real direction but wonder is maybe adventure, maybe ex exploring, OK? And um, it's key. And here is the adjective wandering. It means the rock appears in completely strange situations, completely strange locations. And that's the reason they are called wandering rocks. But it is possible a wanderer is a person who travels um, possibly I mean, I'm just thinking sometimes it's home. A homeless person could be a wanderer, but it's not necessarily homeless. It could be somebody just traveling, somebody on an adventure as well. So it's flexible. So again, it's important to be aware of this. Creating surreal looking scenes. These glacial erratics, 
inspire legends, but also offer scientists clues about climate change over millennia. Okay, so first we have the hyphen. This little line is the hyphen and the function of this little line is to connect two different words to create one word. So here we have surreal and looking completely different words, but with the hyphen, you can combine the two to create one adjective. And here the scenes is the noun and surreal looking is the adjective. And surreal is really, really good vocabulary. And the significance is almost um, not real, almost fake. So it's a very strange sensation. It's very surreal moment. For example, the pandemic, when the city center is empty, it's very surreal. It does not seem real. It seems like a dream. So it's really, really good vocabulary. It's very surreal. Okay. <clears throat> um, again, this word is very good for me. I like this a lot. So the adjective is erratic. And I think in other languages, it's the same. It's a very unpredictable person, a very unpredictable uh, routine, very erratic. Okay. So it's not consistent. And the adjective is very typical, but here it's very strange because it's the noun. Okay. And specifically for the noun here, I suppose it's used for this type of object. So again, it's only really used in this situation, but remember the adjective is more common. OK, so really interesting uh, difference. Scientists, again, you need to be very, very clear that science is the subject in school. You study science, but the adjective is very scientific. The topic, the newspaper is very scientific, but the person is the scientist. So you need to be very clear of the difference of the suffixes. Scientific is the adjective. Science is the subject. Scientist is the person. Very similar with politics. Politics is the subject. Political is the adjective. Politician is the person. So this area is really, really important. A lot of people make the confusion. So if you want to be good at English, if you want, that's important that you take into consideration those two words. OK, clue is good vocabulary as well. We have some synonyms in relation to a clue, a, clue, a hint, maybe a tip. And in Spanish, I think it's un pista. So, for example, a question, if somebody asks you a very, very difficult question and you have no idea of the answer, you need a clue, you want a clue or you need a hint. OK, so really, really good. Also, there is a verb to hint at. So it could be like subtle. We have a very important word in English, very, very subtle. It's the opposite of direct if the person is very direct, but if the person is very subtle. OK, so they do not say exactly what they want. They use maybe a code or they maybe say something uh, secretive. So you have to interpret their message. So, for example, um, my sister, she wants to go to the party, but I have no idea. So she hints at going to the party. She says, Brian, do you know that the party is tomorrow? And that makes me think about the party. So she is hinting at going to the party. So she's not saying directly. She wants to go. She's hinting at something really good expression and really, really fluent and really typical in conversation. Um, and with clue, you can say to be clued in. And that means to be uh, well informed. OK, really, really well informed. If you're clued in, you're really, really well informed. OK, and I have an itchy nose. I'm going to look from my tissue. So to be very, very well informed, the significance is to be uh, clued in. Or we have another expression, if you keep your ear to the ground. And the significance is that you um, listen to all the news, you listen to all the information. So to keep your ear to the ground is an expression that you try to listen to all the news, you try to listen to the gossip, you try to listen to all the expressions, everything, all the information. You keep your ear to the ground. So that means you're listening all the time. Um, and as I said, to be clued in is very, very similar. It means you have all the all the information, all the news. And also, um, we had one expression as well. To hear, I just see the message there. To hear uh, on the grapevine is a very, very famous expression. And that means that you heard from other people. So the grapevine is where they make the juice for the grapes, where they squeeze the grapes and the juice comes down. 
And this is a metaphor for gossip. So you hear on the grapevine, there's a lot of rumors and a lot of gossip. I just see we have a question and the question is, give me a hint. Yeah. So the question, I don't know if people can see on the screen, the press question is, can you give me a hint? And that's typical as well. So to give someone a hint is like, give me a clue. So yes, they're the synonyms and they're very, very important. So really, really good vocabulary. As I said, this one is probably the most advanced, very, very fluent, and it's really, really good. So for example, my friend is very clued in in relation to sport. He knows all the information. He knows all the gossip, really good vocabulary. And also maybe an adjective could be clueless. And that means you have no idea. So if the person's clueless, they have no idea or no information about the situation. They're completely clueless. It's maybe an insult and it's part of English and it's it's a typical adjective as well. Okay. Over is in relation to time, over the year, over the month, over the seasons. So over is just a preposition in relation to time. And now, finally, we're beginning the first paragraph and I'm happy because there's some very, very good vocabulary already in the first paragraph. So I will just read for pronunciation. So it's a question. The first sentence is a question. Ever come across a rock that looked strangely out of place? The odds are good that it's a glacial erratic transported by an ice flow and left somewhere else when melting occurred. In some cases, hundreds of miles away from the original location. So for me, there's maybe two or three super expressions in this paragraph. The next paragraph, erratics can range from palm-sized pebbles to boulders as big as houses. They rest in fields, on mountainsides and under the sea. But these wandering rocks, like the one pictured near this mountain, Ingleborough in England, stand out from their surroundings okay not too difficult but the second paragraph has maybe one probably just one key word okay so here the first expression is to come across and the significance is to find it's a phrasal verb to come across and the significance is to find so for example i was cleaning my room and i came across my book and the significance is to find unexpectedly or to discover unexpectedly typical in an investigation maybe for the police the police are investigating the situation and they discover or they find they come across some new information so really really fluent phrasal verb a perfect example of a phrasal verb in english so here the question is have you ever discovered have you ever found a rock that looked strangely so the ly is the adverb and it's related to the verb look that's the function to describe the verb better. And it's related to strange, which is unusually. And then the expression is out of place. OK, so maybe in the room, you enter the living room with the sofa. You enter the room and you see the room. Something is strange. For example, the books are normally organized. But today the book is in a different position. So something, the book is out of place. That's literal but it could be a metaphor in relation to social situations. This person is out of place. For example, in sport, Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. So the supporter for Atletico Madrid enters the stadium for Real Madrid. And this person is out of place because the other people are wearing white, but this person is wearing red. So this person is out of place. So it's a metaphor and it's just a simple combination of words. For me, this expression is brilliant. OK, so the odds are good. So this is difficult. OK, odd is related to number. For example, one, three, five, seven, nine. They are odd numbers. But we use the adjective odd for relation to strange, unusual and uh, maybe weird. These are the typical, typical synonyms. So if something is very odd, it's a little bit strange um, and it's typical. Maybe you can say another expression, I smell a fish. Uh, no, sorry, I smell a rat. And you can say something is fishy. And this is very famous. So if you smell a rat, you're very, very suspicious. You're very suspicious. Something is strange. Something is out of place. You fear somebody's going to do something bad to you. So you smell a rat. That's a famous expression. Also, 
if something is strained, so we say something is fishy because the smell of fish is maybe very, very strong. So if something is fishy, it's a bit strange, it's a bit unusual, it's a bit odd, okay? And again, it's a very, very fluent expression. And that's the first significance of odd for the adjective. But the next significance is the noun, okay? In the plural, the odds. And this is related to gambling or betting. We have the verb to gamble or to bet. And in Spanish is apuestar, I think, with money. So you pay one euro for the football match and you bet and you gamble and you hope you receive 10 euro back. Okay, that's to bet. So the odds in that situation for one euro and you receive 10 euro, the odds are 10 to one. Okay, so for example, the odds would be 10 to one. And that means you place one euro with the company. Okay, and the name of the company is a bookmaker or a bookies. And if you put one euro and you win, you receive 10 euro. Okay, so the odds in this case are very, very high. And if you have low odds, maybe it's, e we say even money, okay? Because we say even numbers are two, four, six, eight. They're the typical even. Number. So if the odds are even, it's maybe one to one. This means you put one euro and you win, you receive another euro, okay? So the odds are low in this case. And here, the odds are good, which means the, the odds are high. So maybe 10 to 1. Um, oh, no, sorry, the opposite. If the odds are good, that means that it's probable. Okay, so the significance here is the probability is very good or the probability is very, very high. Very common expression, very, very typical in English and very, very fluent expressions, okay? Um, ice flow, no problem. We have one expression. We say to go with the flow. Okay, so to go with the flow is a very, very famous expression, and it means to be relaxed, to be calm, to agree, to do what everybody else wants to do. So, for example, your friends want to go to the party and you have a doubt, but you decide to go with the flow because everybody wants to go. So to go with the flow is a very, very famous expression. Um, and that's it. Maybe with your language, you're flowing. Um, with the language and maybe champagne can flow. So it's a bit flexible, I suppose, but here it's related to the ice flow. Somewhere else, so this word is very small, it's very simple, but we normally, we say anybody else, somebody else, do you want anything else? So after dinner, you are maybe still hungry and your friend asks you, do you want some more food? Do you want something else, something more? So this word is very, very flexible. And it's a big part of English as well. And that's it. The second paragraph, pebble, is a bit difficult. So a pebble is a type of stone. The typical stone that is flat. Okay, a pebble is a flat stone. The typical stone that you throw in the water or you throw in the ocean and it skips. Okay, so that's the pebble. Um, and maybe we say pebble dash, which is maybe typical in the house. So, for example... In the garden, the wall is pebble dashed and it's the specific type of concrete. When you're finished the concrete, it's the small stones that are covering the wall. That's the pebble dash, okay? So the adjective is pebble dashed. The noun is pebble dash and also the verb is to pebble dash as well, okay? So just specific vocabulary and specific um adjectives and words for one particular situation. Okay, so here the pebble is the small stone that you throw in the water. Boulders as big as, so this is just a comparison in relation to the adjective. Comparison, you are as big as your brother. You are as tall. So you can use any adjective that you want. And here the comparison is the uh, boulders. So the big size, the same size as a house comparison. Um, no problem here, to rest after your long day, you relax, you rest. So here they say the boulders rest, so it's a metaphor for position. So for example, the car rests on the road. It's a bit creative, it's a bit fluent, but it is possible. The preposition for the field, we say in the field, because probably it's contained, because this is my field and the next field, so it's separated. This is the reason we say in the field, on, the mountainside because it's a surface, okay? And um, possibly 
the field could be on the field as well. But as I said, in is just because it's divided between two different people, probably. And um, again, the difference between this, that, these, again, to wander is to explore. And um, the final expression, and this is probably the only key expression in this paragraph, is to stand out. And this is very, very important. And maybe, you know, in Espanol, it's destacar. In Portuguese, maybe it's the same. But the verb is to stand out. Maybe we have the expression from the crowd. Okay. And um, we also say to stand out like a sore thumb is a very, very famous expression. So to stand out is literal. You have a lot of people in a line and one person stands out. So this person is very, very different from the other people because everybody is the same. But this person stands out. It could be negative. He's standing out for a negative reason or it could be positive. And usually, I suppose it's positive. For example, in school, one student stands out because this student is very, very intelligent, really has a lot of ability. So this student stands out. And that's the expression to stand out from the crowd. Maybe in a job interview, you want to say something particular. You want to do something special to stand out from the crowd, from the others. OK. And. The other expression is to stand out like a sore thumb. So this is my thumb. And you know when your thumb is has a lot of pain or your thumb is sore, it's enormous. Okay, so if you're, if it's a metaphor again. So if I wear a jacket, I wear a tie and no shirt, for example. So I have no shirt, only the tie, only the jacket. I stand out like a sore thumb. I'm very, very obvious. And the, the no shirt is very, very uh, obvious to other people okay and the adjective is very important here as well because we say outstanding and that's the adjective in spanish it's sobresaliente and again it could be positive outstanding performance outstanding student so really really good word and here it's um in physical it stands out it's different from the other part of the mount okay um in this paragraph I don't think anything's too difficult. I just want to maybe identify maybe one more expression. No, I think that's that's okay. No, I think that's fine. But that could be an interesting article. But as I said, normally it's good to analyze an article. It's good to look at vocabulary and it's good to look at expressions. And here you can see the list of vocabulary and the list of expressions from two paragraphs. Okay, so not too difficult. Now, maybe we can begin with some uh, idioms. OK, I suppose some idioms. Uh, well, no, let's try. Let's try phrasal verbs for the reason, because this document is very, very big and it's necessary that we continue with this document of phrasal verbs. You can see here there are 20 pages of the phrasal verbs. So it's important to continue little by little. Since January, we have completed 16 pages. And for this reason, it's very, very good progress, good work. And today, I think we will continue with the verb to slow. So yesterday we finished with to shut and to shut is like to close, shut the window, shut the door, shut the mouth, which is very vulgar and very strong. But also for phrasal verbs, we say shut up the shop, shut the, the company, shut down and um, shut out is to ignore. So we have a lot of phrasal verbs with the verb to shut. But today we will focus on the verb to slow. OK, so to slow is very general everybody understands to slow and typically for the car the instruction for the person in the car is to slow down because down is again connected with emotion down is slow and negative up is fast with velocity so to slow down is to decrease your speed to decrease your velocity in the car but it could be a metaphor in your life because you're working a lot you're working all the time you're studying, you're partying, you're doing everything. So you've no time to relax. You're, the advice from your friend is to slow down. OK, so it is a metaphor. It could be the car, but it could be for your life as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> that's really, really common. And I think most people have heard something. And for example, the other possibilities, for example, slow up, no, slow out. No, slow under, no, slow back, no, slow in, no. So there's not too many combinations with slow. Um, and 
again, you can say to slow up. So this is the same. It's confusing because um, normally we say slow down, but slow up is possible because maybe to stop the car, you need to move the car here. You need to move the car up to here. So it's maybe related to the movement of the car and not the velocity. So to slow up is maybe just be calm and come here. So you can see the two explanations and they have used exactly the same explanations. So they say because Mary's level in English is lower than the rest of the students, she slows the class down. That's a very good example. So she makes everybody be at the same level as her, for example, in this case. And the other example is the same. Because Mary's level is slower than the rest of the students, she slows the class up. Maybe one is more typical in America. Maybe. I'm not so sure. But I suppose the two are possible as well. Um, and, of course, for the internet can be slow. No problem. The car can be slow. An insult for a person. If you say the person is slow, that's a strong insult. Okay, so mentally... It's the, it's the connection that if, if you say, so be careful, that it's very impolite and it's not nice to say that the person is uh, slow because it's a connection with intelligence and um, that's it. And the comparative will be slower and slowest. So it's regular. It's not too difficult. Um, I'm trying to think of an expression with slow and there's not too many expressions from the top of my head. Okay, the next one is to spell. Just deletriar in Espanol, deletriar la palabra, spell the word. And there is another possibility here in relation to the bruja. For example, a witch in Espanol, the bruja has a spell. Okay. And we say to cast a spell or to put a spell on you. This is typical in the context of the witch. And she, remember, cast is to throw. So she puts the spell on you or she puts the spell on the person, and that means that she places the bad wish or the bad intention on the other person. So it's possible to cast a spell or to put a spell on another, on another person. We also have an adjective to be spell bound means to be amazed or confused. Okay, so if you are spell bound, maybe more American, but it means that you're very, very amazed and um, possibly confused okay so it could be amazed because it's fantastic or it could be maybe confused because something is, is so surprising or something is so amazing so to be spell bound is a possibility and um, we have a phrase about to spell out the word literal in school the teacher asks the student to spell the word but to spell out the word because probably it's in your mind and spell out the word but this is a metaphor in for other situations. Again, previously, we spoke when the person is very direct. It's very obvious. But when the person is very uh, secretive or um, we said maybe to be very subtle, when the person is very subtle, they are not obvious. So in this case, when your friend is not very clear, you say to your friend, please spell the problem out. Tell me exactly what is the problem? Okay, so the spell the problem out has the significance to explain exactly what is the problem. Okay, um, and that's it. And we have another expression, I suppose, is spelling B, which is typical in the United States. It's the competition for the children in the school when they have to spell the word. And it's not typical in um, as a competition. Yes, in school, for of course, for the teacher, you have to spell the word. But in America, they have big competitions and it's called a spelling bee. OK, so that's possible as well. As I said, spellbound. And um, here it's the same explanation. So to spell out means to explain something in a detailed way that the meaning is clearly understood. So again, to be very, very clear, here's the example. He's OK. So so is for intensify. Stupid is the adjective, but so stupid is to intensify. And normally. When you have so, you need that for the consequences. For example, you are so happy that you are going to run very, very fast. You are so happy that you will buy a car. So there's a consequence for your happiness. And here it's the consequence for the stupidity. So you have to spell everything out. That should be T. And that's a perfect example because the person is so silly that 
he does not, she or he does not understand the message. So you have to be very, very clear. You have to literally uh, spell everything out. So it's a very, very good expression and it is typical. <laughs> um, and for me, there's no other possibility. Spell back, no, spell in, no. So that's the only possibility of a phrase or verb or the verb to spell. It's regular, spell, spelled and uh, spelled, but I think the two possibilities are in America. So you can say spell, spelled, or you can say spelt. So I think in the United Kingdom, it's the T. But no problem because the two of them are very flexible and the two would probably be accepted in most situations. But remember, there is probably a distinction between United States English and the British English. So here, this is just a little example because also we have the verb to build. I would say built. Uh, construct would be the same. No, but they're, they're, I think you know them as well. Okay. Standby is very, very famous. So the verb is to stand when you're physically standing. Okay, so to stand in line. Um, to stand the weather is like to tolerate. So you can say, I cannot stand the weather. And that means I cannot tolerate, I cannot cope uh, with, I cannot deal with. Okay, so really, really good vocabulary. I cannot stand the weather even the person the part you you cannot stand this person that means you cannot tolerate you cannot support como supportar in espanol so um to stand in line is just literal in the supermarket you need to stand in line but we also say to make a stand okay and that means in your life when somebody does something and you disagree with the action so you make a stand and you say, no, I disagree. So to make a stand is to be strong with your own opinion and maybe um, criticize the other action. So to make a stand is to do something to prove or to show your uh, attitude or to show your point. OK, and um, also for comedy, we say stand up comedy, which is the type of entertainment in the pub, in the, in the club or the pub where one man or one woman is telling the jokes. So it's a very difficult job. And physically, they are normally standing up. So this is the expression. Stand-up comedy is the typical entertainment in Ireland that you go to the bar and one person is telling the jokes and it's an extremely difficult job. Um, yeah, so I'm sitting down at the moment. So maybe this is sit-down comedy. <laughs> but uh, stand-up comedy is important. There is a phrase or verb to stand somebody up and that's context completely different but it is logical and it's related to romantic situations or a date so if you have a date with a friend or your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you arrange you organize to meet at nine o'clock at the cafe okay so you arrive at nine o'clock and you're standing you're standing and standing and you're standing up and your friend or your date does not arrive so your friend or your date stood you up, so left you alone. Okay, so that's very, very famous, to leave the person alone on a date. Obviously, it's not nice, um, but it's typical in a movie, it's typical in a series, and of course, in reality, it's the same, but to stand a person up is to leave a person waiting on their own for a date, so not to appear, okay? Um, and that's it. But here, we have to stand by, and again, it's physical. Remember, by is like beside. I live by the river. I live by the theater. It's beside. So if you stand beside your friend, it's a metaphor for support. So your friend has a difficulty. Your friend has a problem. And you stand by your friend. You support your friend. So you are beside your friend. Okay. So to stand by a friend or to stand by a person. And there is a famous song, Stand By Me, which is a famous song. And it just means stay with me, support the person, and uh, that's it. And um, I think they're the most typical situations with stand. Of course, it's irregular, stand and stood. Okay, so stand and stood and stood. Also, in relation to sports, you have a stand, which is like in the stadium. It's a stand where the people sit. Okay, it's, it's confusing. Because the name of the, I forget the name in Espanol for the, in the stadium, or maybe Portuguese, when the stadium, where the grada, I think it's a grada in, in Espanol for the stadium. So this is a stand in English, 
but it's confusing because people sit in the stand. <laughs> so welcome to English. That's difficult. Um, that's what we say here. And maybe we have a stand for your mobile phone. Possible as well. It's the object to hold your mobile phone. I have it here. This is a stand for my mobile phone. It's the container to hold the mobile phone. And um, that's it. Okay, I think they're the most typical. Um, of course, we have more to stand in is to substitute. Okay, so for example, in a meeting, you have a very important meeting and you cannot attend the meeting because of a commitment. So you ask your friend to stand physically, stand in for you and you move. So it's like a substitution or a replacement. So that's very, very famous. And the noun is a stand in maybe for a wedding, if the person, like the best man, okay, if the support cannot appear, you need another friend to replace that person. So the stand-in is very, very good. Um, stand out, no, well, yes, yeah, stand out is destacar. Stand up, uh, yeah, we've explained. Stand out, we've explained. Stand back, yeah, it could be possible. Maybe in the situation for the police, and it's literal. If there's an incident, stand back, it's logical. Just move away, okay? And I think that's the most important vocabulary from today. Okay, I'm very happy because I think the Zoom was okay. I think the connection was okay. I think you can see me, which is important compared to yesterday. So that's an improvement. I think we've done the introduction. We've done an article and we've looked at some phrasal verbs. Okay, so that's a lot of work. I'm very happy. That's the typical structure of a day of a class. Um, and that's it. I'm very, very happy. So remember, social media, if you want to connect on social media, you are very, very welcome. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. And this class at the moment is recorded. So after this class, if everything goes well, I will upload this full class to YouTube and I will upload the full class to Facebook and hopefully everything will work fine. In the morning, we have the speaking class at nine o'clock. And today, in 45 minutes, we have another class for the B2 exams. And that's dedicated just to exercises from the B2. And you are welcome to join. There's a small fee, but it's uh, two euro 90. But that's only if you want to have an interest in the B2 exams. It's very good for vocabulary, etc. It's really good. And also, this class is free, as you know. And um, this is the information if you want to support me, if you want to make a small donation, I am, I'm very grateful. And there are three possible ways. The first way is maybe just directly with bank transfer. You can see the details here, maybe with just a small fee, it's a good idea to donate. And um, it will be good support for me. The second possibility is with the application Revolut, which you just need a telephone number or the third possibility is the application Bizoom. So these are all the information if you want to make a small tip or a small donation to support me. And thank you to everybody who has supported me already. It's good at the moment. Yes, it's my job, but I have some support from uh, the government because of the pandemic. So I'm really happy with this. And this is a good opportunity for me to try to return to work and to try to grow online. And that's really the objective of the class. And at the same time, I hope you can learn some things and you can see some structures in relation to English. And I think hopefully it will benefit everybody. And that's really, really the plan and the objective, OK, especially for people who maybe cannot go to class because of the pandemic or people who maybe just in general cannot afford to go to the class. OK, so that is the plan and that is all the information for today. If anyone wants to participate now on Zoom, you are very, very welcome. If you have a question, you are welcome to um, ask the question. You're welcome to join. Just make a comment and I can unmute you. Um, and you're welcome to participate a little if you want. Remember, the class is still recorded. Um, so that's just, no, that's no problem. It's good. But apart from that, um, I hope you all have a good day. Thank you so much. And um, have a very, very good day. So I'll try to stop the recording. I can stop the recording. So again, thank you everybody for the class and I hope you have a very good weekend and talk to you soon.